Uh, good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to you all. Um, this is the first of a number of meetings on architecture which La Biennale have asked us to be involved in, and we think it's a really uh, important and interesting thing to do, to take a series of themes from our manifesto and over the six months to have a series of meetings uh, on, on architecture. And what La Biennale and the President has told us is that, um, that uh, what, what the audience of, of the Biennale really enjoy is to hear architects speaking about how they think and how they work. So today we have chosen a cross-section of uh, participants and we, we think that this symbolizes the, the wonderful uh, character which the Biennale has, which is that it's, it's cross-cultural, it's, it's uh, universal, it's global, and um, that, that it somehow describes the, um, the free space of architectural language within very different cultures. And we have found it, as uh, curators, a fantastic thing to see physically present. You can feel the culture and the climate and the place that the architects come from. And at the same time, we learn from how this response is made to place and culture. We learn how it is that we might respond maybe more directly uh, to our own culture and our own place. So maybe I will just introduce um, President Barata is going to say some words about the theme of free space, but perhaps I would could introduce um, our four speakers. We have four guest speakers. Um, we have Marina Tabasum from uh, Bangladesh. We have Francis Kere from works he, from Burkina Faso and also works in uh, Germany in Berlin. We have Michael Malson from uh, Los Angeles and we have Dorte Mandrup from Denmark. So we, they, these architects come from all different parts of the world and we have chosen their work for very specific reasons and we're delighted that they will make each make a five minute presentation which really is to give you a kind of taster of their way of thinking and then we'll have a, a, a general discussion. Well, I'm... Is this... Okay. Well, I would like just to go back to when we met and we had the first discussions about the theme and the concepts of this, of the incoming Biennale. We started... I started with the word space, but you then added that free. That makes a great difference, of course. <laughs> and uh, uh, that free space uh, can be not only translated in very many, as many different meaning, looking at the vocabulary, but even within one single vocabulary, it may have different meanings and, and meaning different, and, and can uh, ignite different think, thoughts about what we want to engage ourselves. Uh, the word free space, I mean free, I mean I would like just to give you how I did react to this addition of the word free to the space. Free uh, brings me to three possible areas. One is philosophy and psychology, the second is politics, and the third is economics. Psychology and philosophy, uh, free means refusal of constraints of what hampers us, what uh, prevents us to realize uh, through knowledge or through the uh, emotional knowledge what we can be beyond what we are. Freedom, uh, in terms of psychological freedom, is uh, uh, the beginning of desire and the beginning of uh, discovering the multifaceted aspects of the human being. I mean, the, how many of us are in each of us. 
and is the beginning of discovering that we can go beyond utilitarian descriptions of ourselves and of our society and bring in what in general uh, is considered we we'll take this apart and we can describe the society in terms of mechanics and numbers or mathematics. Well, it's bringing back what has been put aside when these philosophy were uh, developed. Uh, bringing in all that means bringing in all the different dimensions that we attach to the human being imagination, creativeness. Uh, so they, when you talk about the uh, freedom connected with the space, uh, then you see that down now we really are, uh, we want to assert that since the space in which we live is the physical a container of what we are, or the physical platform from which we expand ourselves. Uh, talking about freedom connected with space means to introduce into the uh, any theory or any idea of building or urbanism and so on and so forth a concept of the human beings and society which is much richer than any utilitarian philosophy might uh, consider. And uh, abitare is more than building. Or abitare is more than finding a shelter for us uh, to protect us from the rest, is jump on the rest, is one desire to live with the, what is outside of us and discover what is inside of us, and that without psychological freedom, we tend to hide, we tend to uh, squeeze and, and, and reduce. So there is this word which has to... Uh, connected with space is very interesting because it gives a sort of physical expression to what we... to the dimension that we want to reach getting out of a very simplistic concept of the human being. Then there is the political definition. It's a political word that you find in the political dictionary, dictionary of politics. Freedom is, means rights. And, uh, well, it's very interesting to, since we have been talking for decades, years and centuries about the right of having a house, the right of having a shelter for us, for, our, for each of us. And the Greeks divided very clearly the economy of the house and the agora. At first comes the dignity of the human being and the family, providing shelter, providing possibly some piece of, of land to work with and uh, to combine a unity which is uh, some extent self-sufficient, uh, that is the beginning of everything. I mean, self-sufficiency is and shelter is the beginning of the story. But then there is the Agora. And the idea that we have the right to a free space is something that, uh, that we can enjoy and live in around us is an expansion of the right of, of having a house the right of being having just a shelter. So it's a concept, uh, it's an assertion of uh, a concept of welfare state which is much beyond the minimum requirements for protection of our single persons or families and so on. The right to have uh, free space. And then comes the economics. Free space is better that you don't pay for it. <laughs> that, that, but that uh, is something that only a high degree of civilization can consider the production of public goods is an achievement for a society, for an economy. Because the public goods 
as you know, as we have been saying many times, cannot be private properties by the very nature, but it can be only the result either of public institutions and public will or public movements or our uh, needs expressed through the uh, public institution or the result of a gift. And here we are the, to the uh, to this uh, dual sort of way of re uh, getting and obtaining uh, these public goods that we consider uh, fundamental for once again to expand our own existence in terms of uh, gathering, in terms of uh, uh, the, 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 the fact that that space is free means really that it's a place where uh, uh, we we, we are not there because we have an income or be, because we have a rent or because we have it's we are there because we have a right to it and because we, we need for our to organize our existence go back to the psychology psychologists or to freedom in terms of politics but physically we need a place which is free from the economic point of view so uh, and uh, this exhibition underline and is all based on the word generosity. Of course, it's a generosity that has to be <laughs> induced by our will, our desire, our even our political life and institutional life. So, and uh, possibly the two, the freedom, the free space as a result of an assertion of a new right together with the fact that it has to be free from any cost rent or is 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 the correct junction it's a public good to which we have a right so i mean it's uh, it's interesting how uh, all these words applied to the word space seems really seem bring us really to walk around architecture i mean what what it what it what it is what it should be and what it can be in different situations where uh, one of these concepts of freedom comes in the psychological idea of freedom the political idea of freedom the social idea of a free space as a space for our uh, social life for our civil civil society i mean it's a uh, just for the sake of adding complexity to the complexity, I just wanted to say this thing because it's a really, it's a jump into the complexity of our life. And luckily, against any temptation to oversimplification, which is the temptation of today in every country, where um, too many want us to go back to oversimplify everything and to reduce something to black and white or or one and or zero one uh, to bring back uh, ideas and uh, that uh, being, uh, translates into concepts and idea the very fact that human life the human condition is is a complex and the complexity is to be faced if you want really to, to uh, go beyond our single specific interest and we, go, we want to go uh, towards uh, the realization of a, a human civilization which is uh, human uh, because it's able to face all the complexities that are around us. Thank you. It's, it's fantastic to sit here uh, surrounded by um, architects from different parts of the world and to hear the words of the president of the Biennale. Um, the thing that strikes us is that um, it's not by chance that we are in Italy, that we are in Venice and that the, the tender and gentle flame of architecture is held and protected 
and hopefully celebrate it in the, in the Biennale. And that uh, all these architects that are on the stage with us uh, also represent the, uh, what we kind of now call the warrior class, that around the world are these uh, talented, uh, decent uh, people who by chance of life have the intelligence and the circumstance and the commitment to be architects. And that it's not an easy profession, but it's very deeply meaningful and has huge impacts. And I'm conscious of the, the mud on the floor of Bangladesh. I'm conscious of the snow of Greenland and the complexity of California and the relationship of, of Burkina Faso and Berlin and life. And as the president is saying, this kind of complexity of architecture. But then we have to do a kind of a DNA of this discipline. And we are honored that these people have taken a time and taken a pause to try and explain, if you like, in a little detail of their stance. And I think it's true, and maybe we're aware of uh, people who are non-architects, who are um, uh, people who are students and the range of society. It's something that really touches our heart, that the, the Biennale is about communicating far beyond the, the, uh, the kind of inner sanctum of the architectural world. And if we do not communicate to the general public, um, and if we do not make architecture worth supporting, then as architects we're failing in our discipline because we need other people, we need good clients, we need citizens to somehow say, isn't this beauty surrounding me? And especially since 2008, since more than half the world live in urban situations, our responsibility as a discipline is phenomenal because we're making the enclosures. And I think that what strikes me when I look at the range of work within all of the Biennale, um, that the thread of human existence can be torn very easily from a fantastic weave. And as we unravel, if we don't have something better to offer, well, then we're doing damage. So we really are, have to tread lightly on this fragile planet. And one of the um, themes in our manifesto, you know, is the Earth as client, which is a kind of a very general and all-encompassing one. But it's a very serious, that, that we specify timber, we specify concrete, we specify. So we tear trees down, we tear mountains down as a discipline. So it's interesting to walk on the mud of, of Marina's piece just after the howling winds of Greenland that, that also we have to work within the context. And that it's interesting listening to um, Dorta that as the perma ice gets less and less, the relationship of the foundations into the earth uh, have to be modified. So she's experiencing in her daily structural life the effect of global warming. And we're very aware of here in Venice, that we are on the mud flats, if you like, of the Adriatic, and that our buildings are held by forests into the earth. So we are, I don't know the exact structural uh, underneath here, but, but we're presuming that it's uh, trees held together. And these, uh, in the entrance to the Arsenale, we've, we've done or exposed these uh, beautiful structural drawings. So, what is amazing to be on this platform, and we hope we, this is a conversation with yourselves as uh, citizens of the world, that these architects here explain their attitude to their strategies and that we admire their work tremendously. And you're all working acupuncture in different parts of this fragile planet. So maybe we would begin so I in think the... we should start. And Francis, do you, each architect has been asked to speak for five minutes and to show some images, and then we'll have a discussion. So, Francis, we call on you. So, so I, I don't know if I can see the time there. Five minutes is a lot of time to make a mistake, but maybe... Uh, I'll tell you. Uh, okay, so let me put it... So just to control myself, yeah. So, okay, so we have slide. Um, yeah, I, I was, uh, like, like everyone, I was uh, really surprised when Chelly and, uh, um, uh, so when the board invited us. We, we ha you have to know that we are colleagues um, in Mendrisio. 
uh, I hope for a long time. I don't know how much. But I was surprised and I said, wow, what is free space? So, and then uh, at the beginning, we just uh, tried to, to say, uh, tried to analyze, and then I couldn't understand what it is. So um, I will not do it uh, uh, philosophically or intellectually, whatever. I will just share you some pictures, um, which um, um, I was following up, trying to analyze my own work and give a response to uh, the project. So can s someone move the pictures? Okay. Good. Okay. <clears throat> Very quick. So uh, here is evident. Uh, we have space. We have a shadow. We have a tree. So this is part of my culture. If you come along in Burkina, you will see that the tree becomes very important. It's a place where people gather. Um, it costs to plant the tree, which often is not easy in this culture, uh, because people think nature will give us, will give us everything. Uh, but the population is growing, and trees become a, tri a, a, a problem, because people use it for energy. They cut it. So, but this, what you see, can be a kindergarten, a uh, gathering space for everyone, uh, a place to sleep a little bit when it's hot at 12 o'clock. So another inspiration that I, I saw is like, this is a Tuguna. Um, it is it, it most of the time in the middle of a compound and everyone can use it uh, during the day for meeting for everyone. That is now the man-made uh, tree. So. Um, what I try to do in my work is a sort of interpretation. Uh, you often will see that I have big, big roofs according to the stain of the sun. Uh, you have shadow and kid can use it. Um, but here, don't make a mistake and to think to create this is easy. It's not easy. It's often a very strong dialogue. If you look at carefully to the picture uh, in front, you will see a tree. What we do is try to just protect, and you will be surprised to see that constructors say, why you want to save this tree? It is disturbing during construction site, and you have to fight for it. Don't, don't think that it's easy, and I will come with all the argument to just kick you away from that. Uh, Sometimes when we have a chance to do a building, we create uh, a courtyard where kids can gather, uh, but also it can be used as a ceremony. It costs nothing this space, because you have the classrooms surrounding, and it can be used by the community, which I don't know what it is, but uh, however, um, nowadays if we get to commission, here for example is about our parliament house in Burkina Faso, what we wanted to do with my team in Berlin is to try to create a public space. For sure it will cost a lot of money to build the structure itself, um, if I'm thinking about the economy. But something that you have to know, in these places, a parliament house is something that is sur surrounded by high fence, high walls, and a gate with weapons. And you ask yourself who they are protecting inside, those that will represent the, the people. And the ironical thing is, um, if people get angry and angry, you will see them um, tearing down or burning down these kind of buildings, but they keep doing the same. So here we had an idea to create a big, big public space where people can climb to the top of the building as a provocation, hoping that I will not give me the commission. Uh, but I have to encourage you to do because you will be surprised. So here I tell my team, I don't want to do it, but let's come with something that I will say is stupid. And we did it, and to our surprise, they love it. So now the issue is where to get the money. If I'm, sit I'm sitting in an aircraft, I will see someone that came to introduce himself. I am a minister from Burkina Faso, um, and I love your, your, your parliament house. When is it coming? So I'm always surprised, and I don't want to ask. I mean, it's your own government. You don't know that I don't have money to do. I say, oh yes, I'm waiting it to come. So if we have a time here in, in the West, we do things like this, using wooden logs, to simulate a, um, the canopy of the tree. So I'm rushing because I saw that the time is uh, over. Um, 
Here, when we have a chance, another canopy that we created, uh, cre um, uh, and, uh, so create a sort of space where people can sit together, um, be in a restaurant, be at conference room, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But for the intervention here, uh, me and my team here in the room, we have Nina, Vincenzo, and my daughter Josephine. We was intrigued by this structure. It is to host refugee in a hangar of uh, an airport in uh, Berlin, Tempelhof. They are together. It is a uh, practically. I think they have no way to do it, to do it than that. Uh, but I found it unflexible, just to be polite. And so we designed the structure, hoping that the refugee can use it. And uh, as you know, uh, I build all the time with students. So because I think the intellectual issue and the, um, uh, all the other issues can be uh, delivered by many, many of my colleagues. Uh, what I love is the making. So I get the student all the time to Burkina, to Mozambique, to build. Here we said, okay, if uh, um, you tell me to connect the teaching with uh, my professional, okay, I design a little structure with my office and with my assistant in Mendrisio, we build it. And that what we created. It's, it's a cluster, you can go and visit it, that way I don't want to repeat. This one is in Tempelhof, in the airport, it's used now. Uh, you can turn it, you can do many, many compositions of it. And here, it's built by students in Berlin, and uh, later on, we have an example of it here. Um, and that is what you can see. Using textile to create a sort of flexibility, not telling to the user what they have to do with it, but they can close or use the structure to create a sort of a, a, a community gathering or to have an intimate space by closing it. So that is it. Thank you very much. Should I just? No. Uh, so, um, thank you for inviting me <laughs> to this panel. Um, so, when we first heard about this um, idea of Biennale uh, free space, obviously it's not a word uh, that comes to mind, <laughs> something completely new. And then we um, went through the manifesto that was sent to us. And we were particularly drawn by this line, a free space going beyond the visual, choreographing the daily life. And immediately what came to mind is the courtyard of a Bengali hut. And um, it's basically a space, courtyard, is, is, is something where life is lived out in the open. It's kind of a theatrical display of life, uh, which is uh, very connected to nature and very symbiotic relationship between nature and human. And that I find quite compelling always. And these are the elements that you see in the courtyard and they are always um, in an ensemble just being placed in a certain way that creates that space. It's not a distinctly defined space. And um, that's the landscape of Bangladesh. And you can see that these courtyards are basically in a way, essentially free space because they are connected from one to the other. And these spaces are leaking and creating this very social and communal atmosphere. And that's a village where we are working. And this drawing that you see here is actually drawn by the community themselves. So that's also another way of showing the project. This is the southern part of Bangladesh. Uh, this is the Bay of Bengal. And the dark green area that you see is the largest mangrove forest um, that's ever living, and the Royal Bengal Tigers, uh, it's home to the Royal Bengal Tigers. And soon enough, perhaps, it's going to go underwater. We don't, we don't know with the climate change. Uh, but we have a site and a project, which is a resort, very close to that area. And so when we went to the land, it's, it's very lush and green, very fragile landscape. But when I went to the site, for me, it was a kind of a dilemma, like how do you address a site like this which is so powerfully natural? And it felt like a crime to invade this beautiful silence with the roaring noise of architecture. 
So what we did was, in a way, try to find out uh, what would be the possible way of working with this land. And in that sense, at that very moment, I think three things that came to mind was information, knowledge, and wisdom. Information is what we get from Google. And knowledge is basically experience. It's a gathering of experience. And wisdom is basically knowledge and experience uh, through a process of time. It's attested through time that you gain wisdom. And what you have here in the land is actually wisdom. And that wisdom is just so much more important than what we learn in our schools as architects. So that's what we thought of investigating into. And so what we did is we brought in the locals. So it's a connection between the local people and us. So we get their wisdom and our know-how, and that's how we created the project. Uh, it's very um, much vernacular in a way. And so I claim that I'm, I'm an architect who's invisible in this project. It's more the people who are taking the power and in a way empowering them, giving them uh, some sense of ownership, and that's how the project actually uh, got built. And uh, so this is basically not really architecture, <laughs> or it is architecture. We can debate about that. Um, so uh, with that project, what we've done is we've created a, uh, Panigram is the name of the project, uh, the resort. So we have some community initiatives that we've done. Uh, so we do craft diversification workshops uh, because we have a few villages, which are Potter's Village, and uh, Weaver's Village, so there are a number of villages. So we are giving them know-hows about how to develop craft. We are creating savings groups because these savings groups are uh, collecting um, or saving money one dollar a week. Uh, so that money finally will give them a seed bank from where they will take loan of two thousand uh, dollars to create houses. So. Everything actually happens in the courtyards of the villages. So for me, that's the reason why the courtyard is an important space. So here you see some of the $1,500 home projects done in Jinaida. It's very close to the site. And that's one of the houses over there with $1,500. And basically the process is to engage people. They create their own mapping in the beginning. And then they have their own aspirations. Uh, what they talk to us about. So it's not desire, it's more aspirational. And from there, we help them to create their own houses. So this is something we're doing now. And uh, in a way, I also included that in a pedagogical way when I was working or teaching at Harvard uh, GSD. So one of my studio and my studio students visited, and we are in the process of building a few houses uh, with the villagers. So in the, in the pavilion that we have created, basically, uh, since we have such a great connection with our villagers, and they are almost like family to us, we've asked them for some elements so that we can create this abstract courtyard in the uh, space and arsenale that we were given. So all the elements that you see here are actually uh, sourced or taken from the villagers, and they have been generous to give it to us. And, Architecture is invisible. What you see is the wisdom of the land. This is Rohima Begum, and she makes all these uh, beautiful granaries, and one of the granaries from her is donated to the site here. And um, that's a boat, which is a tree trunk curved out, and you can see um, it's, uh, it's, it's generally for the shallow water. That's also there in the uh, pavilion. Uh, that's a grinder, <laughs> and it was used. Uh, so all these different elements are sourced, and these are the people who are generous enough uh, to give it to us uh, to be here in the pavilion. So thank you. <laughs> and now we have Michael. Molson. Um, when Shelley and Yvonne first contacted us to participate uh, in the 
Biennale. I think I'm probably very similar to most of the people who have participated. In this Biennale, they mentioned that the theme was free space, um, and I freaked out because I had no idea how to approach that. It seems so, in a sense, so uh, uh, open uh, as, a, as a concept. And um, I'm from Los Angeles. We work primarily in Los Angeles. Uh, and I wanted to uh, begin to think in the project about that city uh, using that idea of free space. Um, and most people, when they think of LA, uh, think that there's a lot of freedom and there is a lot of space, but those two things together um, are, are unique. Uh, the city is undergoing an enormous amount of change, a great deal of pressure, uh, a great deal of growth. Uh, it's creating um, a significant amount of, of um, possibility for architecture, but one of the things that is not a part of that conversation really is an idea of space. Uh, space for architects often means something which is um, defined or confined, something understandable, a scale which we can relate to, but in fact the scale of Los Angeles uh, very much defies that traditional notion of space. I thought maybe one way to think about the proposal in the beginning uh, was to uh, think not so much of a space in a defined uh, architectural way, but to think more about space as a kind of map, a kind of a network, a series of points that were defined, in this case by projects that we've been involved in, uh, with the idea that over the entire city, these individual projects might in fact start to create a more cohesive, understandable space or whole, or at least approach to the city um, by uh, starting to put them into, um, into uh, context next to each other. But I have been thinking for a long time that uh, architecture's role in a, in a city like Los Angeles around the question of space is not so much uh, in all of the particular projects, but I've become much more interested in whether one piece of architecture, one building, can in fact stand in for the city. Can it be a kind of equivalent to an urban plan? Can architecture be a microcosm of the city itself? And that's something we were looking at with this project, Star Apartments, uh, that we've we've shown here at the Biennale. We started with the idea of uh, space, but really an inhabitant's occupation of space at three very different scales. The scale of the city, the scale of the community, and the scale of the individual. In the case of the scale of the city, we started by mapping uh, the city to look at uh, the textures, the different um, possible gestures of the city, the directions of the city, and how one element might fit into that vast grain. One of the things in looking at cities or looking at landscape, most representations of landscape either are about the foreground, the things very immediately uh, near you, or the far, um, uh, let's say, cityscape, skyline. Uh, but the in-between is often not represented. And Los Angeles is a city that, if nothing else, is all about the in-between. That arrow is where the building is, just to give you a sense of, of a, a small piece of scale. Um, the second part was that idea of community. In this building, uh, which is, um, sits in an area, Skid Row, uh, 102 units of permanent supportive housing for individuals who are uh, formerly homeless. The opportunity here is to start a completely new community uh, amongst individuals who have lived in proximity to each other but never really lived in a, in a more uh, defined or, or positive, progressive sense of community. Our community primarily happens in that middle space between the units up above and the streetscape down below. Uh, it's a new type of space, a kind of, again, uh, microcosm of many of the different um, mechanisms that exist in a city. It has a jogging track, uh, community kitchen, uh, community gardens, series of classrooms, exercise spaces, uh, basketball 
tetherball uh, court, all on that one space, almost as if uh, the, the community spaces that you normally see scattered around the city are all uh, uh, put in one place. They range in, in scale between uh, the activity of the individual and the more collective activity. And on the left, the image uh, is an image uh, before the courts went in, but it's an image I like because uh, the building in, in a lot of ways is made from uh, the found textures and um, scales of the city itself, in this case, the infrastructure of the city to start to become part of that, that community scale. The individual units, uh, the units for the residents, were all made in a, uh, as, as prefabricated units. That was quite a radical idea in Los Angeles. It's more common in other places, but it had never been tested in Los Angeles. It wasn't, in fact, allowed uh, in Los Angeles. We worked with the city to find a way to, to do that. Uh, those individual units, which you see here in some of the maquettes that are on display, uh, are all uh, exactly the same, with the exception of the placement of the window. Uh, the idea being that they are uh, uh, very much armatures, very much neutral armatures, if you will, uh, for the activity of the individual. It is their space, um, quite literally, to make their own, uh, which in itself is a radical concept for many of the individuals just coming off of the street. I like these images, uh, and I want to end with these images, uh, which were, we, we uh, worked with a photographer that we commissioned for uh, this project. We asked uh, each of the uh, residents to uh, point to or pick uh, the thing that meant the most to them in the space. Uh, it's a wide range, a huge diversity of the kinds of things that they connect to uh, in that space. Uh, it's also one of the um, places where uh, the architect uh, uh, steps back. Um, and that question mark of where architecture and the architect creates the platform for space and occupation and individuality to um, exist, and where the architect and architecture steps back and the individual um, steps forward, uh, is one of the complexities I think that exists always in architecture, uh, one that this project is, is very much trying to examine. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, and thank you very much, um, Ivan and Shelley, for inviting uh, to the Biennale and to, to this uh, talk. Um, it's been a great pleasure. Uh, I think today we saw in the uh, prize ceremony that, um, with the applause, that there was a lot of people that's been really happy working with you. So thanks for that. Um, free space. Uh, is uh, very different uh, relating to the context, I, I guess, that you're in. So if we talk about this, the urban context or the city context, I would interpret it very differently. But um, since we've been fortunate enough to work in, um, in relationship to UNESCO protected uh, areas, um, the, the free space uh, interpretation here will be uh, connected to, to these very, very open, very different uh, landscapes. <clears throat> well, um, <clears throat> to, uh, so the interpretation of, of, uh, of uh, free space uh, in this ex exhibition is very much related to, to the landscape uh, context. And uh, for us, placing a building in this context always starts with interpreting everything attached to the site, both physically as well as an abstract artistic um, interpretation. It has to do uh, with creating attachment, establishing a place in, in a very vast area, open space, to, to establish shelter and anchoring for the human body uh, in, in a sort of infinite space by understanding the conditions relating to the very uh, specific context. We're trying to become instruments for reading and measuring, 
wind, climate, daylight, history and culture, and from this knowledge expose the uniqueness of place. The prime generator for our conceptual development of the Wadden Sea Center was to make the building grow naturally from open fields relating to the 360 degree horizon. It's to create shelter from the wind and it's uh, relating to the local areas very rich Viking history by using materials harvested in the nearby fjord and using techniques that has been used here even before the Vikings. When um, asked to do this um, exhibition, we talked a lot about whether it should be the Wadden Sea Center that we would uh, exhibit or the Ice Fjord Center, and we decided that the Ice Fjord was probably much more interesting related to the free space. Um, so, conditions is our interpretation of the extreme focus um, or extreme forces of nature in Greenland around the Ice Fjord and the extreme conditions for human survival in the Arctic as a whole. At the Ice Fjord, uh, we are 250 kilometers above the Arctic Circle. Most of the year, this area is really covered in snow and the temperatures drops far below zero. The wind is um, very harsh, it's twice as much as in Denmark, which is harsh enough. Um, and it's uh, actually moving the snow around in landscape, so uh, you will not recognize uh, the landscape you moved into when you're going back. And the notion of scale here is hardly perceivable. The vast expanses are covered in snow most of the year and appears as a white, almost endless, undefined space. There's no means to measure scale, like trees or buildings or other people. So it becomes very, very abstract. So here, to us, it's very much about creating space, uh, anchoring, um, making a place in this vastness. The daylight is rapidly changing from midnight sun uh, to the complete absence of daylight. Uh, in all of December, it's completely dark uh, and with only the reflection of the snow-covered landscape as the source of light. Right here, this place, the icebergs that has been carved from the world's most productive glacier, slowly and closely packed, will float towards the Disco Bay and float out into the bay. The glacier is rapidly retracting, undoubtedly testifying the accelerating climate change. In the town of Iluliset, you can literally hear the sound of cracking ice um, and the carving glacier sound once in a while. The ice fjord center that we are building here uh, starting this summer um, is a visitor center exhibiting the reading as well as the global importance of the ice and the melting story of the inland ice cap. The center is placed on the edge of the UNESCO World Heritage Site in between the small town of Iluliset with 4,500 people and 3,500 3, dogs, and, uh, which is quite a lot. Um, and um, the Eichfjord uh, Center creates a transition between the culture and the nature. It's also a global gathering point for international researchers and tourists. At the same time, it's also a meeting place, a shelter for locals in their everyday life. The building is lightly floating above the rock, extending the movement out over the Sesimiot Valley, and is hereby exposing the breathtaking views towards the ice fjord. It's also the starting point for the UNESCO walking trails, and by walking the sloping roof, you will get a first view of the vast landscape from the top. It has an aerodynamic shape to prevent snow buildup on the facades and around the building, and by lifting up the building, the meltwater can easily flow underneath the building to the lake below in spring, which is in May, June. The building's large covered outdoor spaces uh, create a shelter from the harsh wind towards east and west, and everyone that passes by can use the building as a natural viewpoint, a gathering point, and a shelter in the hard, harsh weather. 
half of the building is actually covered space, covered outdoor space, um, to make this building free or open for everybody to use, as well as you can use the roof uh, as a gathering point. Well, in the 30th of November, the sun will go down and not show itself at all until the 12th of January, 12-12, uh, when the landscape will be illuminated in 41 minutes. On this day, the local inhabitants will celebrate the return of the sun on exactly this place. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I just found that fascinating uh, to hear people from different parts of the, the world explain to us uh, their raison d'être, the, how they begin. And, and when, uh, I, I find also that they're incredibly radical people behind these charming, smiling people are absolute radicals. Because on one hand you have a, um, like in, in, in the case of the... Uh, the Parliament House of Burkina Faso, where you, you talk about uh, embassies becoming kind of a, a places with security ramps, that, that you turn it on its head and you say, let everybody crawl over, that if it's the symbol of a nation, well, they have the right to be in it and on it and around it, not protect. I find that, that section of your uh, Parliament building absolutely radical as, a, a, as an idea. And, and when Marina talks about, you know, the kind of invisible architect, that the stepping back, that, that it ranges from the, the slight nudge to, to, to include people in the design process or be part of that design process, and then this radical symbolism of a nation saying, let us crawl all over it so we're part of it and we make a building to respond to that. And then when I, I see the, the question and the... the, the um, sensitivity of, of, uh, of your Michael, the, the way you have named the people who live in those places, that it isn't a typology. As a, as a discipline, we kind of talk about housing and we, we make apartments and, and whatever, but what you have done in your presentation and in your exhibit here is that you have named the people and given value to their uniqueness, which means that from the city of Los Angeles to the person, that your architectural breadth has held the kind of reality of life, which I think is really admirable. And the daughter, when you, you talk about the 3,500 dogs, I think it's fantastic that, that you talk about, I, I didn't even write down the, the, the number of humans, but uh, what was the population relative to the dogs? Is it, but about. To, uh, two people to one dog. Uh, which is fantastic in terms of the relationship between animal and human in an incredibly harsh in environment. And in our manifesto that the earth is our client, I think raising from mud to uh, parliament building climbing to individuals in Los Angeles to uh, the, the, the melting, uh, as you described, the carving. And quite by chance, it's just interesting, Dorta and, and uh, Marina's projects uh, presented in the Biennale are close to one another, so you come out of the winds into the mud, and it's that image of the delta. I find that really uh, to to begin uh, to look at that and to look then at the harsh winds. I find it extraordinary that I sit on the, on a podium with four exceptional architects with sensitivity. You all seem to have this ability to stand back to allow life to to happen. 